everybody. I'm Brian Levine. Welcome to the Gould Standard, a regular arts podcast brought to you by the Glenn Gould Foundation. We bring you conversations with remarkable people from across the world of the arts. If music, books, theater and dance, visual arts, poetry and film are essential nutrients in your spiritual diet, you've come to the right place. Be sure to press like, share and subscribe. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please give us your comments, post your questions and be part of our community of friends and supporters. And to get more stimulating words, images, and sounds, pay a visit to our website, www.glengould.ca. When you're there, you'll notice that we are a Canadian registered charity, and we'd be extremely grateful if you would consider making a donation to help us continue our work. Now, our guest today is what used to be known as a man of parts, great accomplishments and gifts in a great many areas. John Ralston Saul certainly is that, and in fact, if I try to enumerate all of his achievements, we may not have time for our conversation. He is an intellectual whose nonfiction writings stride effortlessly between philosophy, political science, history, political economy, multicultural studies, human rights, and Canadian studies. He is the author of six acclaimed novels. He served two terms as the president of Penn International, advocating for the freedom of expression of writers and journalists increasingly under threat around the world. With his wife, the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, he is the co-founder and chair of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, which promotes the inclusion of new Canadian citizens in society, and co-founder of Six Degrees, the Global Forum for Inclusion. Six Degrees is a growing coalition of people around the world who are working to create new language, politics, and actions supporting immigration and refugees and their rapid inclusion in society through citizenship. He is the general editor of Penguin Random House's Extraordinary Canadian series of biographies. In his nonfiction writing, he achieved international acclaim with a trilogy of books of Voltaire's Bastards, The Doubter's Companion, and the book version of his 1995 Massey Lectures, The Unconscious Civilization. In them, he gives a richly nuanced and historically informed critique of alarming trends in contemporary society, particularly the rise of corporatism as a challenger to the power and legitimacy of representative democracy, giving rise to a world in which the individual as citizen, the common good and human rights are subordinated to rule based on negotiation among interest groups. This was followed by On Equilibrium, Six Qualities of the New Humanism, and in other books, A Fair Country, Reflections of a Siamese Twin, and The Comeback, he has turned his gaze closer to home with a penetrating analysis of the particular social, cultural, and political forces that have shaped the Canadian Federation, and refreshingly, the crucial role that Indigenous people, their culture, spirituality, and thought have played in the making of this unprecedented cosmopolity we call Canada with surprising lessons for other countries as well. His works have been translated into 28 languages in 37 countries, and I might say that like many of our other recent guests, John was previously a juror for the Glenn Gould Prize. John, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Brian. It's great great to be here. And, uh, And if I could just say right off the top that, you know, one of the things that isn't said often enough about Glenn Gould, people just think of the magic the magic of the hands and the, and the emotion and the music. But, you know, I've always considered him to be one of the members of what's called the Toronto School of Communications, which is one of the most important modern schools of philosophy, which is why they don't teach it in philosophy, because they, they only want to teach Greeks, Romans, and Europeans. But, he, you know, he's part of that school which invented the new way in which people would relate to each other, before the machines were invented, remember Marshall McLuhan, Harold Innes, Glenn Gould, they invented, and, and, uh, and, and others, they invented what we're now struggling with and wrote about it brilliantly before it existed. And Glenn Gould was right at the core of that. When you go back and look at e- even his writing of uh, his Northern piece, is very much in the soul of what Harold Innes wrote about. 
I couldn't agree more. And in a way, the impacts of technology, which he was fascinated by and in some ways had a more optimistic view of than some of his contemporaries, for example, McLuhan, leads us to a degree into our main subject today. And I'd like to to actually segue into that because this is an arts podcast. And today I'd like to talk about the relationship between the arts and democracy, and particularly the role that the arts might play in a period marked by democracy under threat, which I happen to believe we're living through today. Maybe a good starting point, John, would be to come up with some sort of a working idea of what we mean by democracy. And if you don't mind my sort of kicking off with a suggestion, because there are many different shapes and flavors of democracy through history, and but functional democracy in a modern context, perhaps we could say, is a form of social, political organization and an underlying framework of ideas in which laws, public policies, and social standards are responsible to the will, needs, and material interests of an informed, inclusive citizenry based on a notion of the common good and not on individuals or on special interest groups. Does that seem... That's not bad. (laughs) It's it's really not bad. I mean, I think it captures... It's kind of a... a, It is a Western view, but it's not a prisoner of the right. Western view, which is really tough to do because the Western view of democracy is so dominating that you think you're being free and open and you suddenly realize four sentences in that you're actually trapped. And so I think it is really, really important to say that not only in the past, but today there are different views. And for, just to take an example, you know, the West has great difficulty existing without an enemy. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think other countries do far better at existing without an enemy. China, at its best, is quite happy not to have an enemy. Russia needs an enemy. The United States needs an enemy. England and France and Europe, they need enemies. With Europe, they're trying to form something, a new approach, which is multi-layered democracy, mm-hmm. which doesn't need an enemy. But, but they're being back to the wall, in a sense, by the United <laughs> States... And now China coming up behind that because of the dependence on trade, saying trade is the most important thing. Well, it isn't. You know, humans are the most important thing. So all I wanted to say was that this approach, which immediately says, oh, we lost that enemy. We have a new one, China. And And there are good reasons for saying that. But what it does is it completely reduces the Chinese to a paper mache thing. And it allows the appalling leadership in China to get away, literally, with murder, because you're not giving them credit and therefore responsibility for the richness and complexity of their own history. And there's no question that there, that, that Chinese history and politics is, in its own way, filled with great writing and culture, which were about responsibility to the other, no matter who was in, in power. And, you know, I just... And then I'll stop. But Confucianism. It is, so I'd want to take you right away from, out of the West. We're completely out of the West. Confucianism right. is like so many things, like like the the New Testament. The Confucianism is defined in two completely different ways. The dominant way is the way that the second-rate emperors and mandarins defined it, and the Communist Party today, which are exactly <laughs> right. the same as the second-rate. Uh, mandarins and, 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 and emperors, which is that Confucianism is all about obedience, and it's all about smoothness, the smooth surface of the waters, which, of course, when you think about it, completely denies the centrality of culture. Right. You can't have culture if the, the religion is smoothness, right? You go, but now, if you go back and, first of all, read the people who, who read the Chinese— and are not interested in the power view of Confucius. But there are also now a number of fabulous translations which are not at all based on the old conformist view of Confucius. They're actually based on what Confucius really said. So, you know, when he said in most English translation, he always refers to the, the good people, the thinkers, the, the people who believe in doing the right thing as gentlemen. Well, that was an English version 
of what Confucius meant. He wasn't talking about gentlemen. It was the English who were talking about gentlemen because English democracy was dominated by about 15 to 20 percent of the population who were gentlemen, right? right? right. So Absolutely. they just, and it, that is not at all what he was talking about. He was talking about people who had responsibility and and felt that responsibility towards the whole. And if you didn't fulfill the responsibility, you were not a, a, a Mandarin, you were not a good person, you were not serving properly. So I just say that to say that we can break apart the Western idea we invented democracy in two seconds flat. A good point, which is, and it gets back to to uh, my my remark that there are as many different styles and flavors of democracy as there are people to uh, have implementation of it. And so, you know, throughout Latin America, there may be one kind of struggle for democracy, and in fact, many different ones, because many different countries, many different uh, local and indigenous influences and historical factors, Africa, same thing, and all of them are going to be responsive to uh, things that are distinctively of their uh, societies and cultures. But that having been said, uh, you know, one thing that I, I would like to sort of set aside when I talk about democracy is functional versus formal, because you know, there is, I think, a growing tendency to think of um, democracy as beginning and ending at the ballot box. Uh, once you've cast a vote, then you turn the, the ship of state over to the experts, and you're merely a passive passenger on it, going where they, they d- choose to, ta- to take you in their you know, really, uh, educated and and expert uh, discretion. And I think that that is an unhelpful view of democracy, uh, one that tends to uh, reinforce passivity and also make people uh, go back to sleep uh, between election times. And uh, so regardless of where and in which particular manifestation we see democracy, I think that uh, what I have in mind to talk about is a much more active and engaged form of, of the word. Well, I mean, the the first and the most important thing that, that, that needs to be said is a, is, a, is a variation of what you've just said, which is that that voting is essential because if you don't vote, that piece of the puzzle is gone and it's a central piece of the puzzle. But voting, is, and this is something I've written and said, but there are things you have to repeat all, every time you speak throughout your entire life. Voting is nothing more than the punctuation of democracy. So if you bring back a minority government, that's like a question mark. You know, if you, if you give a massive majority, that's an explana- exclamation mark. <laughs> if it's just sort of an average kind of majority, well, that's a period. And, but, but, but those details of grammar only have meaning if the before and the after are completely filled out. And it's true that if you're a writer or a pianist, or a playwright, or if you're a, a carpenter or an airline pilot, you know, you have a, a full-time job. Right. right. And it is true that you have, so to speak, hired, not in the money sense, people to do a lot of the real work, both the civil services and the elected, you and, and, and the judges. You've hired them to do the day-to-day work for you. But if you do not engage... As a citizen, if you do not speak up, if you are not part of the process in some way, then it will not work. And so what we've witnessed over the last half century is a gradual retreat back into the early days of democracy when there was a lot of gerrymandering in the United States. There was a lot of uh, classism, as in Britain. Uh, There was a lot of elitism as in uh, professional elites who ran everything and there was a lot of money right at the core of power as in the 18th century the salt taxes in France and so the the non-engagement of the citizens increasingly since the arrival of globalization has brought it down to the level of voting or not and at the worst they weren't we weren't even voting in any significant numbers. And now people are building back up the voting, and there is more and more talk again about engagement, but it's not happening yet. And the fight after COVID is going to be all about engagement because the people who had the power from the 1970s increasingly on 
are doing everything they can to delay any form of change during COVID Mm -hmm. so that we can get to the exit and cheer because the vaccinations have happened and cheer and no changes will have been made. Right. Right. And, and, And five years from now, we'll look back and realize that just as in 2008, the financial crisis, with COVID, we blew it. And now we're in an even more dangerous position because the same groups, the same people, the same corporatism is in place. And all we're doing is voting and going to sleep. Right. That's the big risk today. Well, you know, the old saying, uh, crisis is a terrible thing to waste. It seems to me that uh, the people who should use those opportunities to reinvigorate democracy typically waste them. The people who are perhaps on the other side of the the ledger, uh, those who are the promoters of corporatism, uh, rarely do. So, you know, so for instance, uh, we had the famous, you know, the history moment that Francis Fukuyama proclaimed, uh, all of communism. Uh, what did that do? Did it uh, lead to everyone saying, we feel so great about democracy, like you know, the uh, the Athenians victorious showing the, the triumph of a free people? Uh, or was it used as an excuse to promote a kind of uh, corporatist view of the world that that steadily advanced until the financial crisis? And when that happened, you know, it led to a further consolidation of, of corporatism. Yeah, so I mean, just... To- you know, conversations like this are fun because it forces you to remember when you, you yourself got it right or wrong. When, when I guess it was Fukuyama who said the end of history, right? And, yeah. and when, when he said it, I almost immediately started writing that he should resign as a professor and give in his protection as a tenured professor because what he had done was the most profound betrayal of any form of intellectualism and intelligence. And it was the stupidest, to put it bluntly, it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard somebody who was supposed to be smart say. And, and of course, what in reality happened was with people like that, as he realized what an idiotic remark this had been, he gradually slipped his way around to another position without ever admitting that he's been wrong. Right. right. Just as dozens and dozens of the leading spokespersons for globalization have, gra- have just, like overnight, they just turned over and became something else and never went back. No memory, you see. The role mm-hmm. of memory is so important. Never went back to what they said to us about how positive globalism was going to be for democracy. And right. So. Well, expertise means never having to say you're sorry, I guess. You know, there are different experts, a lot of experts. I mean, what's interesting about the COVID thing is that it's the first time we've had a serious conversation about science versus political science, which is not a science at all. Mm -hmm. You know, the social sciences are not sciences. That's been one of the big problems is thinking that they're sciences, whereas the sciences have no certainty in them because they're all about questions. And as you... You never fully answer the question. You go down from question to question to question in science, whatever the area, and you answer bits and pieces of it as you learn more. Whereas in the social sciences, there are constant attempts to assert answers, which is a very dangerous thing. And and that's why I ended Voltaire's Bastards with a chapter celebrating doubt, which everybody thought was very odd at the time that you would Mm. actually end whatever it was, 900-page in reality book with a, a simple chapter about we must re-embrace doubt because you can't have society, civilization, democracy, responsible individualism, engaged people, unless you live by doubt. And well said. Uh, we are, uh, think, in a moment of history that calls for a good deal of doubt and re-examination. And actually, to bring us back to our main subject, the arts, uh, I'd like to sort of veer into the... the Uh, What I think of as a foundational question, which is art and truth. And, um, of course, truth itself is a a huge subject in its own right. But, uh, you know, the Canadian writer and humorist W.O. Mitchell used to speak to school groups, and he would introduce himself as a man who lies for a living. Uh, (laughs) He was a very funny man. He was very very funny funny. and and very perceptive. Uh, At the same time, uh, John Kennedy, uh, his last major speech, his eulogy for Robert Frost, said that art was a form of truth. Yeah, I mean, you see, I, I get very worried just by the word truth. 
I think you know if if you think that that the the democracy has to be built on on doubt, then you can't put truth at the core of it, and of course, nor can you put truth at the core of art. And in fact, so I'll say this because I'll probably repeat it, but you know, in in the nineteen twenties, when Penn, which I was international president of, but the first international president was the novelist Galsworthy, John Galsworthy, Forsyth Saga, etc. And Galsworthy, with others, H.G. Wells, etc., had to put together a charter for the what was the nature of the right of of art if you're a writer, and it, it still exists. I, I I basically thought about it every day for six years because it was such a tool for every crisis that I that we faced every day, multiple crises, and and it basically comes down to two ideas. One is a belief in in untrammeled, complete freedom of expression with no limitations. One. And then sitting over there, not a parallel, just an observation, which is no writer uh, must uh, can engage in encouraging hatred. So those are the two ideas. And if you actually think about art through literature, but plays, I mean, almost all art, uh, Great art never promotes hatred. That's propaganda. Mm -hmm. And the moment somebody who is an artist, like, say, Celine, moves from when they were a genius into being a a rabid anti-Semite, as he goes nuts and whatever, you realize he's moving from being an artist to being a propagandist because he's promoting art, uh, promoting hatred. Right, right, and and that very simple idea tells you everything about a democracy, because it's founded on relationships between people. It's founded on something which art is founded on, which is is based on which is a balance between the individual, however you define it, not just the Western, the various Western ways, the individual and the group. You can't simply have a domination of the individual. You have to have some kind of terrible, unresolvable equilibrium that always is changing between individuals and their responsibilities and rights and the groups and their responsibilities and rights. And I don't mean interest groups. I mean, you know, language groups, belief groups, uh, uh, you can go down this long list of what groups stand for. And and that struggle is the thing that was lost in the West it, to a great extent in the obsession with individual rights, which were very, very important and are very, very important. But it was that obsession in the late 19th century which opened the door to corporatism. Mm-hmm. Because people like, I've forgotten, forgotten which pope, now, it brought out a very, very important encyclical, late 19th, 30th, 20th century, and it's terrible, um, trying to get the Catholic Church back into the game by suggesting a kind of group-based form of running society. And it wasn't bad. About half of it is really very good. But mm-hmm. it was based on obedience, essentially. Unions and but, uh, obedience. And it's that that people like Mussolini picked up and that the corporations picked up and of course eventually the interest groups after the second world war and you know so the, you have to balance these two and the most interesting group who in canada who today can still put together very consciously individual rights with group rights and the role of culture and art are are the indigenous peoples they st- they they never lost it they never lost that balance between the three things, the role of art, the the role of the individual, the role of the group. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we in, say, Toronto or London or Paris or Rome have lost that almost entirely. And in, you know, Chicago, it's it's been lost, that balance. And that makes democracy not work and art decorative. Right. And that actually... Uh leads i think rather nicely into into the next area that i wanted to to touch on which is the question of whether all art is political and by that i'm not talking about you know specifically polemical art of the let's say bertolt brecht 
variety. Uh, but I'd like to suggest that uh, at a certain fundamental level, all art is political because if you start as your as your point of, of departure that, you know, everyone is of equal value. In order to be a citizen, some e- equality uh, recognition of other members of, of the polity is is needed. And art evokes experience, emotion, uh, passion, and recognition that is fundamentally human. And the fact that it also allows people to empathize with um, others who are completely unlike them, the characters uh, in a novel. I mean, bourgeois Victorians could weep at the death of Little Nell in the old curiosity shop, and uh, that that is a recognition of of a common humanity that can be foundational in a democratic society. Well, I mean... Great art is a whole bunch of things. It can't help but be political, even if it doesn't realize it is. And most of the time, the politics has to be buried deep within it. Because if it's political on the surface, it runs into the Brecht problem, you know, which, is, which is a limiting right, right. problem, right? But so, I mean, if you, you know, do go back to, to Athens, here you've got a society with slaves, a much less evil version of slavery than that of Brazil and the United States. And, but I- I- the citizens are given, who are mainly farmers are given paid time off because they don't have much money. They are paid to come to Athens to go to the big political meetings, but, but to go to the theater. Because the theater, which is great art, we're still looking at the plays that have survived, and they're very funny, they're very serious, and so on. The theater was the place in which people most, in a most complex way, were able to think about themselves, truth, society, obligation, engagement, the group versus the individual, Mm -hmm. why they belonged, what it meant to, you know, so standing up in the agora or in whatever form of gathering was a much, in fundamentally a much less fundamental thing than going to a play and then talking and thinking about the play and talking about the play. That formed completely how you were going to deal with everything else. So that you had this, which was the plays are all about doubt in its most profound sense, mm-hmm. politics in its most profound sense. But then it, the art then bleeds into everything else. So you have all the formalities, which every society needs to have, which where art has to be at the center of the formalities of the society and the democracy and the, the religion, everything. But you you also have it, for example, we've tried to recreate it and failed totally because of money. You also have the role of art in sports, the role of sports in society, which, of course, the Athenians understood completely. And we understand now less than we did 50 years ago because of the commercialization. Right. Right. You know, so that the introduction of culture, quotes unquote, into the Olympics is really window dressing. I mean, good people come... And they're paid some money, and that's always good for artists, right? Good. But it's not what was meant by art at the Olympics in the time of Athens. It was an integrated part, as it was into military, as it was into everything that society did. Mm-hmm. So that, that, you know, the most damning and dangerous part of what we're struggling with today is that although there are probably more artists per capita than there have ever been, good, me- good, medium, and bad, you know, whatever that is, and we don't know which is which yet, right? Right. right. That's found out later on. Yeah, time, <laughs> time will tell. Time will tell. Sometimes we got it right, sometimes we got it completely wrong. But we have allowed art to be marginalized from the reality of politics and citizenship and the great ethical debates of the citizenry 
and and completely from sports, from business, largely from the civil services, completely from government and politics. It's all been marginalized. So what's left is a kind of struggle on the margins, and good people try to draw it in, but are constantly shoved back, so that, that the heart of the arts, when you look at how society functions, is largely about entertaining the middle class on the weekend. I do think that the shared experience of art is valuable in building community, in empathy, the recognition of you know, others as your peers and equals, even if their position in, in life and in society is vastly different. And that, I think, does tend, particularly in the context of a corporatist world, which measures everything by exchange value, can be quite subversive. And so the, I guess, one response to that, I mean, there's the response of, you know, the Hitlers and the Stalins and the McCarthys, which is to purge, or for that matter, Nelson Rockefeller to force Diego Rivera to paint over his mural, is to reduce art to the level of light entertainment so that no one takes it very seriously and no one thinks it's very important, as you were describing. Yeah, I mean, let let me come at that in a couple of ways. I mean, first of all, I think that art just moves, and and it moves, and it moves, and it moves, and and that's what the the rational schools have never been able to accept because the rational schools are so tied to conscious debate, which is a very valuable element, but Mm -hmm. is only one element in a civilization. And, of course, a, a, a rationally dominated society can't have art at the core of it. Because art is all about intuition and imagination and has ethics in it and so on. But it moves in circles and circles. So an example. Last night we watched, because that's what we do today, uh, a revolutionary version of Handel's Messiah. So there you've got it. It's basically Old Testament. It's basically British-German. It's been done millions of times, always around Christmas when it actually it belongs in Easter. You right. know, sort of thing. It's really peculiar. And it has great music in it. And then Joel Ivany of, of Against the Grain Opera Company, which is this revolutionary opera company in Toronto, did a version of it, which is on between now, and I don't know when this is going out. It takes place on the Arctic ice. It takes place in the mountains in the north. It takes place... In the, on the Pacific, it's outdoors, most of it. And the singers are outdoors in all these astonishing places. And they're singing in Inuktitut and in Dene and in French. And they're singing in all these languages which are so important for Canada, these indigenous languages, not just English and French, but all these indigenous languages. And, and, and suddenly you look at this whole thing and you realize that Joel and all the other people, I just know Joel's name for the moment, but all these other people and the singers and everything and the, and the cameramen and women have invented a new way of seeking truth through art using a very old piece of theater from Dublin, you know, and, and turned it into something completely different, which is not nationalistic, mm-hmm. which is all about uh, this balance between the individual and the group, and living with complexity, and living with doubt, and it's, right. so it's 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 a it's suddenly a boom, a, a, a production masterpiece, if you like. So the, the second thing I wanted to say was that I think that for Canadians in particular, but I could say for New Zealanders and Australians, and I think there are many other places in the world. But I just take those three countries which have a lot in common, vis-a-vis indivi- vis-a-vis indigenous peoples, and and what we've all tried to do since we arrived, good and bad, you know, the bad, very mm-hmm. important, but there's also a lot of good, and the role of Indigenous people in it. And there's no question that, that what the immigrants never managed to do in Canada, even though we tried very hard, was to destroy, people would say, to destroy Indigenous peoples right. and their civilizations. But the core of what we did, because we never did the wars, really, except for one, the core of what we tried to do was to destroy the art and the culture. Remember that those old colonial governments, and right up to today, instinctively understood that if they could destroy the languages and the art 
and the spiritual which was tied to the art and the land, they could destroy the people. So it's not as if the West has never understood the importance of language, culture, art in at the core of democracy and mm. the existence of civilizations. We've always understood it, but we've used it in a very negative way because we're in a dominant position. And we failed, thank God. Mm. We failed, even though we came pretty close around 1900. You know, we, we, we'd really driven the population down and we'd banned all sorts of things. And and I look at, you know, so many of my, the people I know and people I don't know in the indigenous community who are artists and who are creators, and they, but also other people. And they live within this civilizations or these civilizations in which spirituality is at the core, but it's not spirituality as in political religion or religion isolated. It's, it's spirituality built into culture, built into art, built into politics. Right. So this is incredibly valuable. If I look at it from the point of view of a white guy like me, I say, my God, in this country, Canada, we actually have an important percentage of the population who are the original and who, in spite of us, are, are rebuilding this very important other way of thinking about art and truth, art and democracy, art and civilization, right. uh, and art and spirituality. And so when you go into almost every public meeting in Canada today, there's a, a, a land acknowledgement. Now, you can just read it out. That's fine. You know, after all, people who go to church or people who go to the House of Commons, they always start by reading out the same thing. That's what an organized society does. So there's nothing yep. unusual about that. But more and more people are using that moment to say something interesting about the link between place, art, society, and how we live with each other. You know, the dish with one spoon. You know, it's this, this how do we how do we live in an egalitarian way together? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. an amazing it, it's an amazing concept. And you know, I, I think about you know, some of the most remarkable people. I knew Joe Gosnell, who just died, who was the great chief of the, elected chief of the, of the Nishka. Just as soon as I met him, I felt that I was meeting the prince, as described, properly translated, by Confucius. Mm -hmm. the, the great prince. And I, and I remember being on international trips with him. And after about 24 hours, all the kind of big businessmen on the trip and the, everybody realized that the only one who was, in the natural sense, a leader was Joe Gosnell. And they all, mm -hmm. all the white guys and everybody else and the, and the women all gathered around Joe Gosnell because he had a, a grasp on this relationship between people and place and art and justice and inclusion. And it wasn't uh, uh, merely rational. It was actually built in. And I could give you many, many other examples. And, and you know, in the 19th century, I, I always think that my favorite is, is Big Bear on the prairies, who was massively badly treated, but is great, one of the greatest figures of this expanse. And, it, it, and he, he was the sort of elected figure but there was also, when he failed, a military leader who took over. But there were also the spiritual leaders who were tied to art, mm -hmm. you know, closely tied to art in all its forms. So, I mean, today, one of the biggest opportunities that Canadian society has is to listen and learn from what Indigenous people are showing us. The, the generosity, after all the evil that was done, the generosity they're showing in, in, in telling us about how you can do it another way. This is incredibly important. And yes. art is at the core of those societies. And, of course, there's a wisdom to it because although there is certainly, well, there is still monumental level of it, levels of inequality and injustice totally racism and and i mean we still have huge problems to overcome and more than enough reason for an eternity of resentment and wanting nothing to do with with the settlers there is the question how are we going to live together because we don't really have much much of a choice so we have to find a way 
Well, well, I don't know if you know, but that was what Le Maire, who was then the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, said at the end of the decision in the 90s, which is one of the most important decisions. I mean, it, it, the misrepresentation of what has happened in Canada in the last 40 years is so vast, I don't even know where to begin. So the, it's not the fault of the citizens, it's the fault of the leadership. That The Nishka, the, uh, the Delgabat decision was one of the most revolutionary decisions made by a European-style Supreme Court, in which it basically said, we're not going to follow European-style law, we're going to file follow a mixture of European and indigenous style law. And, mm-hmm. and he ended by saying, we're going to have to live with this. But I want to, I just brought this because I knew that, the, you, I didn't know you would actually say it, but you actually said it. So this is the, from the introduction to the Royal Commission on Indigenous uh, Aboriginal Affairs, chaired, co-chaired by the great George Erasmus, who is still very much with us. And he, in it, it begins by saying, and this, this is really fascinating, it begins by saying, And you can see immediately how art and doubt fits into it. Canada is a test case for a grand notion. So so if when you keep going, everybody thinks he said nation. Right. Right. And you you only realize that he didn't say nation. He said notion. (laughs) Right. Notion. (laughs) Yeah. Canada is a test case for a grand notion. The notion. That's where you get it. That dissimilar peoples can share lands, resources, power, and dreams while respecting and sustaining their differences. The story of Canada is a story of many such peoples trying and failing and trying again to live together in peace and harmony. It's an astonishing... That is a political paragraph based in culture, based in civilization. And it changes radically the European-American idea of what a democracy is. Right. The the entire assimilationist project, the the melting pot, the you know, what is it to be a true Swede to, yeah. to, to pick one, you know, and I think that this acceptance and embrace of complexity, which is not easy. I mean it's something we in this country struggle with all the time and there are steps forward and steps back, laws about what you can wear, for example, in, in one province. But no one I think who is serious, has seriously questioned that the direction is an exciting and rich, fertile one that is kind of, a, as you say, a unique test tube for the world. If the world could be persuaded to actually pay attention to it, it might actually be quite illuminating. At the same time, getting us back to culture, the the other reality is that we in Canada are bombarded by a monolithic cultural machine that, you know, heads our way from the South. And certainly most people who experience culture in the the widespread sense are largely experiencing an American cultural vision. It seems as though these things, I mean, we certainly haven't been completely assimilated, but but it's an element of what we we live with in trying to hold on to our identity, such as it is, variegated and and mixed as it is, every single day. You know, there is a sort of a, an imperial project based on, you know, how the most money can be made. And we are certainly right in the line of, of sight of that onslaught. Well, let me say something positive and something negative about that. I mean, the, the positive is that, you know, the United States in contradiction to its official documents, the Constitution, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has created uh, many ex- astonishing ele- elements of art and culture. Some of them are not first-rate, but some of them are uh, popular music. I mean, it is the, the great center, and, and, and that, I'm not putting that down. I'm putting it right. up. That is true grassroots, yeah. even when the com- even when commerce grabs hold of it. It is truly an expression of something real. Pro- probably because no other modern democracy was built on the industrialization of slavery, which continued until the mid '60s. Mm-hmm. Let's never forget that it goes from the birth of the colonies to the 1960s. This idea of industrialized slavery, it's not the same. It existed everywhere, slavery. But that, with Brazil, is un, 
paralleled. It's not what it was the slavery was in the in the medieval empires or even in in Greece or Rome. It's a different kind of slavery because all those slaveries had elements in which you could be you could graduate out of them, out of the slavery. Right. The, the industrialization of it, the link to the industrial revolution, and the the importance of it had for the British and French empires because the people who made the money out of American and Latin American uh, slavery were, in fact, the European empires. The, the North Americans and the South Americans were just the horrible uh, journeymen for right. the British and French empires and the others because they made the real money in, in places like Bristol and I'm trying to, Birmingham and, and yeah, so on. Liverpool. Liverpool, all that stuff. The cotton industry in England, I mean, was entirely built on American slavery. Uh, they made the money. And the ships, yep. the ships were French and British. They weren't American, right? Largely French and British. So that, they, but out of all of that has come an amazing grassroots culture. And that's one of the most exciting things. And that in a way, not Hollywood, that in a way is what has fascinated the world. Mm-hmm. Not what most Americans think has fascinated the world. But the, the, the other positive is that really the, the New Deal was a moment when you saw a number of incredibly positive facets of what was possible in the United States. And the way in which FDR allowed, and I meant he had to prevent the elites from getting in the way, allowed culture to get through and to play an incredibly important role at every level, in the work camps, I mean, in the fields. I mean, he literally was part of allowing, he didn't do it, an explosion in culture, which the United States had never experienced at all levels. And in a sense, the best in American art is still living off the New Deal in many ways. And But of mm. course, it's been shut down in terms of its access to the whole of the society and is never really talked about that way. It's talked about as left wing now. Right. Whereas right. Whole, so, so that... In fact, as, as radical, what was, yeah. you know, what was mainstream political thought and social construct up until the, the 1960s is now radical, apparently. Well, it's the victory of, of, of a certain ideology and, and, and basically the defeat of public education by private education and by the elites who go to mm-hmm. the private schools. And so, but the, the negative in it is that increasingly as the United States became a bigger and bigger empire, and it still is, even though it's been defeated on most sensible fronts, it still has half half the military budget of the world. It, you know, it has control of communications through a series of monopolies and so on. That it has increasingly, as with the French and British empires, used culture as a tool of the empire. I mean, I'll give you a tiny example. Just look at any film made in the United States and count how many seconds go by before you see an American flag. You can't make a film in the United States without putting the flag in right away, usually within the 30 seconds, to reassure people that no matter how critical it is of whatever, it's okay. Right. It's okay. But this sort of idea of culture as a propagandist tool, but leave it alone to do whatever it wants to do so that some of it is of of great value, but it's still speaking for the empire in a certain way. And so that's... That's something which is incredibly difficult for a country like Canada because we have this, it's actually a 9,000 kilometer border if you include Alaska, unprecedented, and our only border. How do we deal with that? And that's another reason that one of the great truths about the indigenous role in this country, they always used to say that we were saved from the United States by our Francophone element, which was true to some extent. Right. Right. But even more profoundly important, Frank, and I'm not talking about saving us as a nation state in the 19th century sense, but even more profound for our ability to have single tier health care, for our ability to try to be nonviolent, for our ability to, to live with complexity, that comes out of the indigenous peoples. And, and we, are the, we are the supplicants. We're not the leaders. We're the supplicants in all of this. And we have to understand that even if they're still only under 5% of the population, they have more to offer us 
in, 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 in the broadest sense than we have to offer them. Sure, we have to offer certain things which they're part of, which have to do with you know, Western science and so on, which they're part of. But they have something to offer which is profoundly about civilization and art and about a different approach. And we have to listen very, very carefully to what they're saying. And we have to learn because that is going to decide not about our difference with the United States, but our ability to exist as a different kind of place based on complexity. Right. And and I think it requires us to approach our evolving culture, collective culture, if you will, with a certain openness to subtlety. It's actually very interesting that one of the other countries that is the most absorbed by Canadian indigenous culture is Japan, itself a a civilization in which subtlety and delicacy of nuance is very highly valued. And I think that that is probably not coincidental. There's a real fascination, for example, in Japan with Inuit art. Yeah, and, and Germany has a fascinating relation. Some of it is romantic in 19th century, but some of it also ties into what Wagner at his best, not his worst, at his best, right. was trying to get at. You know? Yeah. That there's something else there which is not simply about, quote-unquote, modernism, which leads to, you know, it's often said about Germany, and the German, great German historians have written wonderful books about how they missed turning the corner because they did modernism without democracy mm-hmm. in the, uh, from 1848 on or 1849 on. And that led, without the democracy, part of it, that led inevitably to authoritarianism and so on. And now they're, they've gone back to 1848 since the Second World War and to some extent are trying to do it again in a very interesting and different way. And I notice whenever I'm there that as soon as in friends of mine, I'm often with, there with them, indigenous writers, creators speak up, the Germans are really listening. Mm-hmm. They're really listening because they feel there's something there. The French and the English don't get it. They just have great right. difficulty getting it. The Italians, I don't really know. Or this. The Spanish probably might, because they have a more complex relationship, right. which ends up with great loss, right? And so they know that it's more complicated out there. But years ago, I used to spend a lot of time in Southeast Asia, and I remember walking with a friend of mine, a journalist, in, in the 80s, through big oh, 19th century park in the center of Bangkok, and it's sort of, you know, it's a place where poor people would go mainly and things now. And then suddenly we saw in the middle of it this, this early 20th century building that turned out to be a former, what's his name, the man who built all the libraries. Oh, Carnegie? A Carnegie Library. Oh, so, wow. you see, this is the 19th century concept of doing good. In, in Bang, uh, Thailand wasn't really a colony, but it was surrounded by colonies. One of its strengths was it never was a colony. But it had a Carnegie Library right in the middle. And the, they'd take it out most of the books, and in the center it had fish tanks, so people could go <laughs> in and look at fish. But they had all these books around the walls, and all these books were from the 20s and 30s, hardbacks. Huh. So, and nobody goes in there, right? Nobody who reads English goes in there. I mean, nobody's, nobody really, English is spoken by a very small percentage in Thailand, and they wouldn't be walking in that park. So, and it would have been there for decades, right? And so uh, my friend and I said, oh, my God, look at these hardbacks. And it was all the great publishers in England and the United States. Mm -hmm. We said, oh, my God, look at these hardbacks from, you know, from, I don't know, you think of the names. And and he said, there's got to be in here maybe a a first edition of a Hemingway or a yeah, first yeah. edition of a whatever. And I mean, and there'll be some wonderful books in here. Look at, look at this. We look at every book in this bloody library, probably, probably like a thousand books. I mean, and they were all by authors I've never heard of, and they were all crap. Oh, dear. <laughs> so that was the British Empire equivalent of, of mass market television today. Right. You sent that stuff out. Is third-rate novels and third-rate whatevers. So this has always existed as a tool of empires. You know, so that's art as propaganda, mm-hmm. not art. Right. And, and a very good point, too, because the most commercial expressions of art and culture have their roots in something very real and authentic. So From something, yeah. Uh, yeah, Ap- uh, Appalachian folk songs, mm. what we call bluegrass, comes from dispossessed people in Scotland, Ireland, 
and England who are transported or ended up as as poor farmers. It merges with African culture. We get the blues and uh, rhythm and blues and then rock and roll and then the commercial recording industry as it exists today. So, yeah. So, I I mean, I think that we, that, that this role of culture and this role of art and creativity is so complex because on top of which, as we said earlier, we don't even know what we're going to walk into this library and say, who the hell are all these people? Right. And you start looking at it, you say, right. it's garbage. And you say, well, at the time they sort of knew but didn't know, and many people believed it would go somewhere. So somebody like Fukuyama, you know, is garbage. Right. Right. He'll be in that library equivalent as, as a sort of joke. Right. right. We know that now. We, there's no way back for him. Right. And some of the people who were thought to be wonderful by a very small group of people will turn out to be of enormous, enormous importance. Yeah, exactly. I mean, waiting for Godot creeps towards universalism, but it is probably the greatest play of the 20th century in English, if that's what it's in. Right. You know, but it had to creep because it was in a new language that wasn't English. Who knows? Who knows, right? Who knows what it is? Yes. And because it was written in original versions in English and French, that freed it from the prison of a single language into this other world that Beckett was able to inhabit. Yeah, absolutely. And we only uh, understand a quarter of what that play is about. I've seen it in garages. I've seen it in grand theaters. I've seen it on the streets. I will always see it because it is perhaps the great theatrical masterpiece of a hundred years, you know? Exactly. And, you know, history is a great tool because it it performs a great sorting function, as you've said, that sifts out a lot of the dross. We never know whether it misses, you know, great pearls along the way that simply never come to light. But it does have a way of, of making what's truly valuable come to the surface and and then we're all the richer for it. I wanted to to move on because you've touched a couple times on art versus propaganda and certainly the modern concept of propaganda has its origins in the 20th century. You know, some people say that it it grew out of the effort to persuade Americans to get into the the first world war and the the work of people like Edward Bernays and you know, but obviously was refined by many many different regimes and implemented in in different ways. And one thing's for sure, our propaganda is often, if not always accompanied by images some music, different kinds of messages designed to to drive its message. And I think it's easy enough to say none of that is art because it's it's created for a different purpose. But if we want to get to the root of and bring ourselves back to art that in some ways aligns with, supports, encourages, or reflects the democratic spirit, surely propaganda ain't it. No, propaganda is not it. You know, everybody talked about, you know, Trump as the arrival of populism. And, you know, just to be selfish, you know, I was writing about the return of populism in the early 90s. And, and others were, too. That right. You could see it coming back as, part of, as, a, as one of the outcomes of the failure of democracy and, it, the, and the marginalization of art and culture from society. And the the power of corporatism rising and rising. So right. you were going to get populism automatically. And so when I did the Massey Lectures, and it was the Unconscious Civilization in 95, it had an, and I say this because it's a personal experience, it's not your author interview, it, 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 it had an amazing impact and sat around the world at number one and all these commercial things. Why? Because I made this argument about corp, the victory of corporatism after the Second World War and how Mussolini was really the the biggest victor with a V, victor of the Second World War because his theory, backed by many philosophers, including Durkheim, for example, about corporatism, was put in place in Italy very badly and dishonestly in the 20s, from the 20s on, picked up in an even more dishonest way by Hitler. So... You know, so the idea of populism attached to corporatism is is a very standard approach. And you know, I, I always thought one of the great early early half de- quarter democracy examples of it was a guy called Palmerston, Lord Palmerston, who mm-hmm. is one of the landowners 
in Ireland who led to all the Irish Catholics and Protestants actually starving to death and ending up in Canada and the United States. So he goes on, he's foreign minister, a great man who pushes for war, uses cheap culture. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of this, a very famous song which is, comes out of that period now, which is was sung by everybody. It'll come to me in a sec, maybe. Right. And and one of his elections, he became prime minister. One of his elections that he led, either as prime minister or a senior member, he lived across the road from Green Park in a, in a house which is still there. It's now a, a company or something. And Green Park is one of the parks right in the center of London, near Buckingham Palace. And it and and they put in a fence. The fence was this high, <laughs> with like a little thing like that, you know, just to say this is the edge of the park. It was actually, you were still in the 18th century. It wasn't actually to keep people out. But he, in, in, in Trump, I mean, Trump learned exactly all this stuff. He did a whole national campaign on the fact that the elites, I mean, my God, this is Lord Palmerston. Right, the, the man who destroyed all the Irish Catholics, right, and made all the wars, the, the, the Crimea War and everything. He said that fence was an attempt by the aristocracy to destroy the rights of the people and to keep them out of the parks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he won the election. Well, it was a big right. part of winning the election. Right. right. So I mean, this right. is not new. This kind of this kind of of stuff. I think that there are many many sources for propaganda today. But for me, the single most important source, because it comes in all sorts of different languages at the same time, and, and, and the elites, it, it, it's porous in terms of how the elites use it, because they're always, in, in, particularly in the 19th, 30, 20th century, a lot of the elites spoke two, three, four languages. Yes, you know. absolutely. So stuff spread, with it, and, and the elites traveled. No one else traveled. So they went to Paris, they went to Germany, they went to London. Is, is really the triumph of the will, Lenny Riefenstahl's film. Yes. Created after the, now help me here, the, the massacre the, by the SS uh, of the brown shirts in 1933, just after Hitler comes to power, and it was the Nuremberg meeting. Nuremberg rallies. The rallies, rallies, yeah. Which yeah. they did every year. But they were in big trouble, the Nazis, because they massacred all these young people, the brown shirts, who had been big been big supporters and the SS and whatever had taken over so they got this well-known film figure a beautiful woman to come in and make this film the triumph of the will and most people have seen little clips of it and most people don't even know what it's from right whenever you see a sort of astonishing scene of Hitler it's always from triumph of the will pretty well and I don't know whether Brian whether you've seen the whole thing or not I'm I've not seen, trying to embarrass you. I'm, no, I, I've seen about a half hour of it. Okay, so they yeah. re- they cleaned it up. There's a full version of it. You just have to sit down and watch it from beginning to end. And you suddenly realize that every Coca-Cola ad you've ever seen, every political propaganda stuff you've ever seen in the United States, in Canada, in Britain, in France, in Italy, everything that's propaganda, how do you make someone look like a hero? The role of sports. She did a second film on the Olympics. Right, Olympia. Olympia, which ties together, right, with it. But all of that, how to do it in the post-war period, everywhere in the world, but particularly in the West, all comes out of the triumph of the will. And people, it should be taught in every school, at least every public school, so that people see the roots of the evil of propaganda and how it goes not simply into politics right. and into the misuse of art, but it goes into everything about our societies, you know, everything. Right. From the first well, second on with Hitler in the skies coming down through the skies. I mean, it, like, I don't know what percentage of movies have used that as a heroic methodology or the lighting of the, of the Nazi leaders. That yes. lighting system is used by everybody for every second-rate and third-rate politician. You know. And it, it, it is designed to suppress any kind of a critical judgment because you're so swept away with the, the grandeur of it and also the use of this kind of archetypal vision. You know, There's really no way for 
argument or doubt to creep in. It simply is the beginning and end of the statement, completely self-contained, and it, it really is, in a certain sense, a kind of emotional assault, you know, that renders the any critical faculty neutered. But but you see, it's even goes. It, 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 it's it's life is so important. So, Trump, you know, yeah. uh, this incredible pancake makeup, this yes. remarkable hair, this silly sort of person who is not a hero in any sense that he did everything he could not to go to war, right? Like the, like yes. the second George Bush, everything he could. Who who treated professional wrestling wrestling, which is popular art. Right, it's made up. It's popular art. It's grassroots art. Yes. Uh, but he treated it as a form of reality in order to make money and then tried to govern a country on the basis of that idea of reality. So you now go back to Triumph of the Will and you pull yourself out of what you've been sucked into and you look at it as coldly as you can. And you suddenly see that Hitler is this silly little man. His shirt collars don't fit. Right. He's a jowly middle-aged guy who's nothing at all. And, and, and some of the followers, they're so preposterous as physical figures. They're not heroes at all. But her strength as a propagandist is so great that you think that these silly-looking and sounding people are of great meaning. It's a remarkable, a remarkable example of what propaganda can do to you and it takes you straight into the cigarette industry right. into you know you you name it it takes you right into the worst of politics into why should i learn french when god wrote the bible in english you know it's all that stuff it's exactly there. it's there well and you raise a really good point because for those of us who let's say are not swept away by the the persona of trump he's so patently obvious, obvious, you know, to his followers, he seems to articulate something that they are yearning for and, be and believe in, which really has to be based on some concept that this man is for us. He is disinterested. He's not only for himself, to those of us who are not taken in by that, he's transparently for himself. He is completely driven by his own ego, his own aggrandizement, and so on. Same thing with with Hitler and Triumph of the Will and, and many other propaganda statements since then, the anti-communist Red Scare films and all the rest of it. It's a, you could almost describe it as a propaganda-induced psychotic break with reality. How can you not see it? It's so obviously real, and yet people don't see it. So I guess to bring us back to the difference between art and propaganda, one of the things is I doubt that there is any major work of art that ever induced psychosis of that kind. Even if it's some self-described work, work of fantasy, it tends to bring us back to some kind of grounding in reality whether it's an emotional reality, human reality, a sense of, you know, outraged justice over the depiction of an injustice, and the complete divorcing of reality that you think of as propaganda is, is one of its distinguishing marks. Yeah, I mean, you know, through circumstances, I was at, I guess, the 60th anniversary of the... Um, liberation of Auschwitz, Auschwitz mm -hmm. which was an astonishing, astonishing moment. It's like the most astonishing story. Anyway, uh, one tiny element of it. Berlusconi, you know, a perfect example of a populist, <laughs> yes. a, bil a billionaire, wearing thick makeup, hair, whatever, I mean, very similar to the others, right, arrived a good 45 minutes late. It was at night, and as a prime minister, he would be in the second row because heads of state are in the first row. Right. And, and all the survivors were in the center. Right. And he arrived, and I've never forgotten this because I saw this. Right. He arrived with all his makeup and his perfect, beautiful hair, <laughs> wearing a beautiful, beautiful, I don't know, uh, jacket and trousers and a little beautiful scarf hanging down like this and lovely little gloves. And it was about minus 10, freezing, freezing. Yeah. Everybody was freezing. 
and he was dressed for like plus 20. Right. Oh, he arrived 45 minutes late and made an enormous fuss at a loud voice because he didn't like where he was seated and he refused to go and sit in his seat and everybody could hear it including yeah. the survivors of Auschwitz could hear him complaining about his seat dressed for a fashion show and yet he was able to use his his mastery of propaganda to win more elections and that's not about stupidity of the Italian people that's right. about the power the evil power or the power of evil of propaganda i've never how can you con- forget that you can't forget that you know and that's just i, I, I could give you 20 stories like that right. seen or read about and it shows you the dangerous uh, situation we're in but 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 art in its reality is something so unstoppable in the end even when artists have to hide it because and this comes back to the truth problem because often the artist is a obliged to hide a certain amount of stuff because they're doing it for a prince so they have to hide stuff i mean think about goya you know i mean doing these paintings which everybody would know later on showed the the royal family to be complete dorks right <laughs> you know masterpieces they he actually rerouted propaganda into great art if you like right. because he right. got them to believe that they were being painted by the greatest artist when everybody else could see that he was saying, overthrow these guys. Right. right. So art c- can be very, very manipulative if it's truly, truly a great. And Goya is one of the most astonishing examples of that. But the same is true today when you think about the power of money in the creation of art. Now, some of it is freer than it's ever been. And there are wonderful people giving money for great, for great in the hope that great art will be produced. Well, like in terms of production, like the 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 Handel's Messiah that I described right. just as, you know yesterday, I saw and it is something new, brand new, but it's there. You know, you don't have to be Rockefeller and get Diego de Rivera, Diego de Rivera to paint it over. You actually yes. subtly give orders, which is what people tried to do in the Renaissance. You know, and and even before the Renaissance, and the artists had to struggle to find ways through and around it and behind it so that in the end what they created was not what the people who paid them thought they were creating. And a lot of the the great cartoons of the churches, you know, all those stories of of Judgment Day or, you know, the birth of Christ and the the voyage and all that are painted as cartoons by by Giotto and, and so on in the churches... When you stare at them, and many people have written this, you stare at them, you say, what were they really trying to say? They were saying something else than what they were being paid to say. You go into the, the city hall in Siena. I've forgotten the artist now. It's terrible. And there's, there's sort of good government and bad government, the room with good right. government on one side and bad government on the other side. So in one sense, it was a moment when a very good government wanted propaganda put up showing the difference between good government and bad government. But, but the, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. But anyway, but the artist who did this in real time in the city hall of Siena, it's the greatest mm. evocation, practical on the surface of good government versus bad. He did it at such a high level of art that you're not qu- entirely sure what they understood about what he was actually saying. And, you know, and, and interestingly enough, in, I sat there once because I was going to put it in one of my books, which was talking about democracy in Siena. And I sat there for a couple of days just on a stone bench, which was quite cold. So then I brought a cushion to sit on and, and, and stared and stared and stared. I read a couple of books beforehand and during and afterwards. What did people said that he was trying to say? And, 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 and by the end, I wrote something which I... He can't remember quite now, but I wrote some, which I thought I was trying. I was getting at what was the meaning of these astonishing mosaics, which are cartoons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which are which are the artist using art. In that case, with with the willing cooperation at some level, Lorenzetti. I've just been helped here, Lorenzetti. Lorenzetti. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's an astonishing thing, and so that's the best. But of course, many of them had to deal with really 
dangerous people, you know, Borges and so on. Yes, exactly. And, and today you have to deal with the Koch, one of the Koch brothers, who's now died, but yes. has spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in New York winning a place for himself. But at the heart and of it... it this is and one of the great figures of anti, anti-democratic, anti-citizenship figures of the second half of the 20th century. Right. Well, that's, that is another of the messages of art, which is that things are not what they immediately seem to be. And that's a message we carry through to public life because that same Koch brother proclaimed himself a champion of human liberty. Yes. But not of democracy. Yes. And because he would have probably said, if questioned, that democracy actually limits human liberty. But, you know, they, I mean, one of the key themes in, in much Renaissance visual art is the fragility of life, reflections on mortality, which, of course, undermines the, the grandeur of princes. And if those messages are buried everywhere throughout Renaissance painting and, and late medieval painting as well, you know, in more immediate or more contemporary context, certainly one of the most moving examples of the artist who cannot openly express himself but still manages to would be, for me, Dmitry Shostakovich living under the, you know, the the Stalinist terror and and surviving while so many around him disappeared forever, his friends, his colleagues, members of his family, and still was able to express the rage and the grief and the profound sense of tragedy in his music while always flirting with the the possibility that he could be next. The fascinating thing is, of course, now the the tendency is to roll Hitler and Stalin together and the Nazis and the Russian Communist Party together as if they were one and the same. They were one and the same in a number of ways, certainly in terms of the murder of people. Although it probably, in terms of murdering people who were considered to be Russians as opposed to minorities, you know, so the, the, the Nazis were big specialists in murdering anybody who wasn't an Aryan. That's what they right. really specialized in and what an Aryan was supposed to be, of which the Jewish people were at the leaders as victims of this. And, of course, they were at the heart of, of art and culture in Berlin and therefore, mm. in, in, the, in the very eyesight of the Nazis, who were a party profoundly at the low levels of, of art and, and culture. You, you know, there was a great, now I'm going to do another forgetting of names, maybe I'll be saved again. The president of the Berlin Academy of Artists, or whatever it was called, was Jewish. A uh, very famous artist, and he had also, I think, the year or something before been declared, before the Nazis came to power, like in '30 or something, been declared an honorary uh, citizen of Berlin. A great, right. great man, and he lived out almost next door to where the uh, the conference was held to decide on the final. Oh, uh, Vanze. Vanze. He had a house yeah. two doors down from Vanze. It's still there. Yeah. And uh, no, it's not Heinrich Mann. It's. <laughs> It's not. It, it's and and they they had a big house. They were quite a successful family, attached to the Nuremberg the, to the the gates in Berlin. And the night the Nazis, the day the Nazis took power, and they marched under the the, the, the Brandenburg gates with torches. You've all seen photographs right. of that. He stood on his balcony next door, about three or four floors up, and he stared down. And I can't say it in German, but he said, he said. I cannot eat enough to vomit enough. <laughs> astonishing, astonishing yeah. man. It, it, yeah. it, it, really a, a great, great figure. He, right. he died before they could kill him, and he was at sort of at the end of the list because he was so famous. When they came to get his wife, who was then in her 80s, they were very polite, this SS officer, and she said, excuse me for a moment, I'll just go and get my things. And she went in her room and committed suicide. The children had already uh, escaped. Anyway, I've well, taken us way off track here. But If we feel the need for change, it seems that art is not at least currently the vehicle for it. Because, again, the, the structures that exist really treat it as a form of entertainment only, an amusement. Well, that's uh, what they want. Yes. That's what they, they want it to be on Canada Day or... 
something like that. And, right. Uh, sorry, I, you were going on. No, I, w- I was going to say, I mean, the kind of impact that Dickens or Zola or Steinbeck, again, I'm limiting myself to Western examples, but they're, they're the ones I'm the most familiar with. Can we, can you imagine us getting to the point where in the, in the culture that we inhabit right now, those kinds of artworks can produce the same kind of insatiable appetite for reform that moves us back towards an active engaged citizenship and a receding of the of the corporatist model. Yes. Because certainly I see I see the the politics to a great deal in the United States with many grassroots movement rising up and for the moment being thwarted by by corporatist establishment. But, you know, the way, for example, Woody Guthrie could be an inspiring figure is contrasted with the fact that, you know, one of the the icons of 1960s protest just sold his entire catalog to a large corporation for $300 million. Yeah, I, I, that I wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> but... Well, I, I'm, I'm being cute, but... Yeah, but, I mean, but... Well, I mean, look, I think that... I think the answer is yes... I think, but we have to think very carefully. I mean, the artists are going to go on doing what what they, what we can do. I'm going to go on writing troubling books as as long as I can do it and upsetting as many people as I can on purpose while giving the sense that there is something that can be done because you're giving language to people. You know, and, and I always say that one of the, one, there are two or three roles of a writer. One of the roles is to actually produce the words, the nouns, the sentences, the paragraphs that people can steal. And use as a way of doing things differently. And you look through history and, you know, if we're lucky, if we're lucky, we'll get a sentence which will survive and which will have played a role. Dickens was really something because he changed an enormous amount. And something as on the surface icky as A Christmas Carol actually was an enormous revolutionary act seen from a middle class, upper middle class point of view that it changed the way a whole class was able to talk about doing better. Now, it was, a, it, was, it was not enough, but it was actually something, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that what... And it was a much more... You remember that sort of in between the first and the second, it's early second wave industrial revolution. And so it wasn't as neatly shut down. It was actually very disorderly. Our problem today is that corporatism is very structured and organized, and we've got more people university educated than ever before in history, and that we've allowed the universities to be turned into structures where people are learning more, for example, about about the management of art than they are about art. And the, the social scientists never talk about art. Virtually, I mean, some do, but virtually art is marginalized from the social scientists. So you're talking about political science and economics and sociology without talking about art. This is lunacy. This is complete lunacy. This was never intended. You go back and you look at Adam Smith or, you know, or any of the great economists uh, after him, Keynes, they were all involved in the arts. You You look at all the great military leaders... They were all involved in the arts. There's a very famous French field marshal who, the night before battles, would always bring his officers together to do a play in his tent. I don't know what that means. But the point is that we've evacuated all of that and made ourselves feel good by using it on the sides because there's a lot of it. You you remind me of the probably apocryphal statement attributed to Churchill there that during the the war and uh, the second world war and even during the blitz there were regular concerts by uh, a celebrated pianist named Myra Hess very well recognized for her Bach playing at the British Museum and they were open to the public and there was a bit of a an attempt in parliament to say w- during the times like these during this great this great conflict that we're going through you know how can you be spending resources on concerts like this and he reportedly retorted what do you think we're fighting this war for yeah well and he was a very problematic figure and even he, 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 was. he understood it because he went back in, in his age he went back into the period of disorder yes 
And, and whereas most of them were talking about either a, a formalized class system or the beginnings of, of, of corporatism, if you like. So what use is that? What use is that? Exactly. You know, exactly. and I have to say that, that this COVID crisis, there has been the intervention of the art, arts community as much as it can. But I have seen very, very little understanding in any governments around the democracies about the role that art has to play at the core of any major social crisis. And that tells you where we are versus where, you know, how, how societies, a lot of things have been improved, but how societies thought of themselves during the Second World War versus how societies think about themselves today, the fact that the arts were now increasingly... We're finding our way in. But I can tell you, this is no encouragement from the bureaucracy or the political leadership, which is more cut off from, the, from art than I... Right. I don't know when it has been more cut off from art. When you look around, at, 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 and, and there are almost... There may be a few exceptions. I can't think of them. Often. Well, they're, they're good at paying lip service to it, but... It, but we're uh, not talking it, about lip service. We're talking right. about no, no. That that skill they have. The but really understanding at a very deep level, and that comes from art being part of their lives. And you know, being a philistine, being someone who only sees it as a form of light entertainment, is I think part of the problem. But again, going back to Dickens, and I'm glad you mentioned a Christmas Carol because. I think it did something pretty remarkable, that work particularly, because the central figure, Scrooge, is the embodiment of, you know, the engine of social growth in Victorian England, the, okay. the businessman, the man of commerce. He even spouts Malthusian ideas, decreasing the surplus population. Oh, yeah. And so, but, so that work, that short work, in a sense if it was read, and I think it was read in this way, got the ruling elites to actually see their own role in a negative light. They were the villains, and they had to transform. And I don't know whether you could draw a direct line between that and various reform commissions that, you know, that took place subsequently that helped to, to ease the lot of the poor in England. But I think there's probably a connection. There's part of it. No, no, he gave language to it. And you could say, you know, Margaret Atwood, with the work that he, she's done in the last couple of years, has given language and costume. Everybody forgets with, with the, the domination of the rag trade and the, the, the sort of, you know, fashion as an irrelevant thing. Right. She, she's actually given costume, which is so important to the meaning, what it looks like. And yes. in, in an interesting way. So that, that attaches to the opposite you know, which was Lenny Riefenstahl, who's using yeah. costume. They use costume in order to do evil, right? And so, I, I mean, look, the other day, as you know, my wife and I are, are very started at this Institute for Canadian Citizenship, and we really work on how to get new citizens involved as citizens in society. And we're doing more and more now with people who are not yet citizens. That's where we started. Right. And both in terms of big international debates like Six Degrees, but also the moment someone arrives in Canada, 85, 86% of immigrants to Canada become citizens within five years. 86% within five years. In the United States, it's 40%. And in Europe, it'd be 8, 10, 12%. So this is a philosophical position which we have taken. Whatever evil we have done, whatever mistakes we have made, where we have ended up, which is filled with errors, filled with things not done, filled with taking advantage of migrant workers and so on. Nevertheless, that position is a very important position. And we believe that at the core of being a citizen is art in the general sense and culture. So... We have programs like uh, Canoe, which used to be called the Cultural Access Pass, which gives right. all new citizens access, free access for the first year of citizenship to virtually every cultural institution in the country. It's a great with thing. It really is wonderful. So, so the other day, I'm talking to some people in, in a Zoom thing, 
And somebody says, well, you know, these people, of course, they're so brave and so wonderful and it's great that they're becoming citizens. And, of course, they have to work so hard in the beginning to get jobs and to learn the English and French or French and to get their kids educated and so on. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't say that. You have absolutely no right to say that. It is not true that culture is what you get after you've got a job. After right. you've been educated, culture is at the, and imagination and creativity is at the core of what we are as a civilization. If not, we are not. And do not fall into this trap, this corporatist trap of saying, well, once you've become lower middle class, middle class, lucky people, you will get culture and we'll give it to you. I mean, that's garbage. Right. It's right. garbage. And so that's why everything we try to do puts culture at the core of what we do, and art at the core of what we do. Can I, I, I read one little thing to you. Can I read one other thing to you? Oh, please, it's please. Like, so the, in, in 1840, Louis-Philippe Lafontaine met Robert Baldwin, and they, over the 40s, became the founders of the modern Canadian idea of democracy. They weren't involved in indigenous issues. So that was sort of in the hands of the governor general. But they put in place lar- the, all the, the, the fundamental pieces of what, has worked in our society, along with indigenous influences. And, and in three years in power, they just did an enormous amount of stuff. But in 1840, in order to pull together the Francophones and the Anglophones, La Fontaine wrote a one-page thing in his newspaper. It's called The Address to the Electors of Terrebonne. So it's a very traditional sort of thing yes. that's been used in history. And in it, there are you know calls for generalized public education uh, wonderful paragraph on immigration and citizenship. And, and near the end, he starts talking about this. And this is, remember, he became in 1848, March 11th, the first Prime Minister of Canada as a, a flawed democracy, but a democracy, a real democracy. Right. You know, and in it, he talks about social equality and political liberty. And beyond social equality, we must have political liberty. He's in the context of empires. Without Mm -hmm. political liberty, we can have no future. And then he says, they, the empires and so on, they can deny us our political liberty only if they are able to destroy that social equality, which constitutes the distinctive characteristic has met as much of the population of Upper Canada as of Lower Canada. For this social equality must necessarily bring us our political liberty. The principles of a people are stronger than the laws imposed upon them. No privileged caste beyond and above the mass of the people can exist in Canada. This is the, this is the foundational paragraph it's of Canadian fantastic. democracy. And by a French-Canadian Catholic in the 1840s. Right. So I read that because at the heart of that, because I know a lot about that period, he was very interested. He read like mad, just read. He had one of the great libraries, which, of course, was burnt in an attack on (laughs) his house by the anti-democratic forces. He was very interested in architecture. He was very interested in art. He and Robert Baldwin exchanged books with each Mm -hmm. with each other. And they had a sense of, of this sort of inclusivity of, I think, I don't want to overstate it. Maybe they didn't have time or know enough about great art. I don't know. They certainly did in terms of writing. The library, their libraries were astonishing for a miserable little colony like Canada. Right. right. And I, I think that idea that, that corporatism has brought of a, of a pyramidal society with elites at the top, while pretending that it's all about voting, when in fact it's just... Voting is a methodology for freeing up the elites as you move up the pyramid. There you are in the roots of our democracy. Most of our fundamental laws that tie to justice came in those three years. The roots of them come in those three years. There they are talking about with a clarity, which no one would dare use today. No Mm -hmm. one would say, you know, and, and people would laugh at them or they'd say, oh, you're so far to the left or whatever. Yeah. But clear idea and clearly linked to art, and to a concept of uh, culture. It, uh, the art grows out of the people, which is a, a slight twisting of, of a Wallace Stevens poet. 
uh, poem, but it's it's true. And just if I can add it, is a sneak sneak into that. Remember that the great sculpture of Athens was not for the elites; it was for everybody. Yes. It was in the streets. The the dictators of Florence in the Renaissance spent hours, days, moving big, important sculptures around so that they would have a max, maximum impact on the public. The cartoons right. done by Giotto and company in the churches were public art. So this is completely the opposite of the idea that great art is somehow a private thing for, right. for the elites. Or, yes, the, the idea that the arts are elitist is the greatest... Well, it's an industrial revolution. Slander. Hmm? Yeah. Slander. It, it, it's, it's, it's a slander. slander. Yeah, it's a revolu- it, it comes out of the industrial revolution, out right. of the birth of a new utilitarian class system. Yes, which exactly. Should, and so that you, you do end up creating public galleries, but if you look at the structure of all of that and the ownership of all of that, and how much it costs. And so, on. so that's why it's such an important message to say to new citizens, you know, the first act as a citizen, you, you know, we, on our side is every cultural institution in this country is open to you yes, and your families. And we hope that you will come and take over and be part of it. And that actually, I think, takes us to a good point of conclusion, which are, hopeful signs for the future. And I I think that there are actually a lot of hopeful signs. First of all, I think that there is a growing willingness to look at some of the social assumptions that have been promoted through the ascendancy of corporatism much more critically, because frankly, it you know, one of the byproducts has been a great deal of social disruption, a great deal of economic disruption, and a great growth in inequality. But I also think that that creates an enormous invitation for artists today to, you know, as they say, once more into the breach of this kind of discourse. So I'm I'm hopeful, and I hope you are too. Well, I I have you know, as always, I live in doubt, (laughs) and what I fear is that we, as I think I said earlier, we've got so far in the COVID crisis. Having done nothing in the crisis of 2008, which should have been the logical end of the assumptions of globalization and corporatism. Yes. It should have been, and they managed to get through it richer and pretending that nothing had happened. And now here we are with light at the end of the tunnel in terms of COVID, and they've managed to get this far without any serious implications for the fundamental systems in place. And this delaying tactic is very, very dangerous, very dangerous. And, and, you know, it is a reminder of the fact that you have to control power in order to make changes. And art has right. a big role to play in the way power can be changed. And I do think it's once more into the breach. And I do think there are a lot of allies. I think there are a lot of allies everywhere in society, including in the business world. There are allies. Oh, absolutely. There are absolutely. allies everywhere. Um, Absolutely. But they have, frankly, to, they have to be coalesced, brought together, and there has to be the language, whether it's in dance or in art or in, in novels or in essays, wherever it is, it, it has to be there to combat the dominant language of the last 40 years that promotes economics to number one, that talks about efficiency all the time, which is a, the equivalent of populism. It's a very low-level thing, efficiency. You need it, but not at the top, right? Right. And the utilitarian view that everything must have a purpose and everything must be done fast and you mustn't look sideways. All this stuff, all the assumptions, let's say, of the last half century have to be shoved out of the way. You keep the details that are okay, but you, you have to reformulate. And art has a central role in this reformulation. And we have to be bloody-minded about it, frankly, and Mm -hmm. and determined about it. Right. And I guess it boils down to getting our priorities straight, for one thing. And, I mean, one of the things that encourages me is a, a growing level of not being bought in by younger people who have certainly shown a great willingness to embrace concepts outside of the corporatist model. You know, if you look at things like 
the Sunrise Movement and the position that someone like Greta Thunberg has yeah. has achieved around environmentalism, despite every attempt to marginalize and to exclude them. And uh, it's very interesting to see that a lot of polling, again, I'm more familiar with U.S. examples, shows that people under 30 are really questioning this. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps, and again, art and culture may well play a very important role in this, is demography the future path to our democracy? Well, I, you know, look, uh, I mean, we've been through this half century where one of the interesting things that happened was the, really the explosion of NGOs and people going into the street. I'm 110% in favor of being in the street and, and have often been in the street. And certainly when I was president of Penn for six years, uh, you were endlessly in the street, so to speak. But talking to power from the street is essential, an essential part of, of, of a rebirth of democracy. Um, but if you don't take power, it won't be. Yes. You're simply you're shouting at the people who are your enemies. It, better to take their place. Take Absolutely. their place, for God's sake. Don't shout at them. Shout at them and take their place. Uh, so that's one thing. And I think that is starting to happen. And you're, you're seeing that in, in various places. But it isn't very strong at this point. It really is not very strong. Power is still treated as a horrible place because so many dubious people, joke-like figures. And, and it was from that earlier conversation about how Lenny Riefenstahl made Hitler look you know, like a hero, and you look, you think to yourself, well, how could Donald Trump, how could Boris Johnson, how could Berlusconi, how could, you know, and you just go through the country, so you think, how, well, the answer is, it's pro partly propaganda, but it's also, if you assume that public, that power is evil, then you will not want to take it yourself, and therefore right. you will leave it to people, you will be, feel, in a way, righteous. Yeah, anyway. yeah. But it, it's not just a distaste for power or the powerful. It's that the barriers to securing power in, involve, at least currently, a lot of, I think, what they would regard as ethical compromises. You know, you have to be, you know, secure the money to run a campaign to, and then make promises to interest groups that you will ultimately have to pay back and and so on i mean that i i, I don't mean to be an argument a an anta antagonist to my own point i agree with you i mean you know politics is ultimately where it's at because they get to make the laws and they have the police forces and the militaries and the guns and the the means of enforcing so the answer really to that is you're absolutely right but but you know it it actually is not that expensive in most countries it's that expensive in corrupt countries, mm -hmm. which includes, obviously, the United States. It, it ruins your life in any country because it's a horrible life being in politics, a horrible life, and always has been for thousands of years. But, and therefore, you might get the wrong kind of people because it's such a horrible life and they get pleasure out of the superficialities of power. But I do think that the element where there's room for... Hard work, not pessimism, really hard work, is that to a great extent, the movements against power and hopefully to take power do not themselves include culture and art and language fundamentally. They are right. not fundamentally at the core of that. And that is a, an enormous weakness. And again, I'm sorry, you, you look at history and you find that, you know, the moments, and they're not long enough, the moments when humanism or decency or good people came to power and were able to make enough changes, you know, often a short period of time before they were stabbed or thrown out or whatever, or marginalized, that, you know, that art and culture were at the center of it. When Solon created the modern legal form and the modern way of doing away with debt and the beginning of Greek democracy, when he did all that in one year in power, never forget, he was the most famous poet of Athens. He was a, right. And he was able to put it in the language which everybody in the society could understand. And so we have to find a way with this gigantic arts community and creative community, we have to find a way to be 
not pretending that we have the answers, but those who want power have to embrace the reality of the real relationship between them and the citizens and language and, right. and visions and forms and sounds. They, and that's why I go back to the indigenous idea of philosophy and how societies work. They have that idea of how it all fits together in spite of us trying to muck them up in every possible way. They right. have that. We do not yet have that. It, we have lost that. And we have to figure out, that's why I say listen to them. We have to figure out how this stuff works together. How ideas are not something you hire somebody for as a consultant once you've got power, having used populism. Right. So this has not been resolved. And this, is, this lies at the heart of our problem today, our challenge. Well, well, I think that actually that does give us a point to sum up because I, even those of us who are in, let's say, the, the back 40 of, of the race around the track would like to say, hope that we're going to leave the world a more just place, a more democratic place, a more human place. And unfortunately, we're going to have to rely on those coming up in younger generations to do it because, you know, taken as a whole, we, we haven't always done so well. But hopefully the arts will be part of that solution because it is part of integrating the entirety of human experience into our public life. And for those of, of you who are hungering for justice, just remember what Martin Luther said, why should the devil have all the best tunes? And, and can I add a last thing? Sure, so please. This is why part of doing this has to be a revolution in the schools and the universities, where, you know, we are not, we have not allowed the universities to blossom into a place of citizenship, where, by definition, art and culture are at the center. We've allowed universities to go off towards the utilitarian, as they've been increasingly funded by the corporatist right. method. So, I mean, that's just one very important example of how we have to think about the ways in which changes can be made. And yes, it is true that people get older and new people come and they have an obligation and a responsibility and they have energy and power. But, you know, one of the most evil things done in the last half century has been the gradual marginalization of older people. Mm -hmm. Because the utilitarian system, always run by those who were kind of in the Middle Ages, the utilitarian system shoved them into a place where they would either be very poor or self-satisfied and fobbed off with going on cruises. I mean, talk about the living dead. <laughs> you know, and, and going through art without it actually being made any sense of to them. And coming back with almost a lesser understanding of what they've seen than what they knew before they went, because they've been given right. a lie, essentially. And above all, not being able to play their role as citizens. And I think a large part of depression among older people comes from this disgraceful marginalization. And COVID has shown the extent to which this evil has been done because we didn't mind if they died. Right. And we had time between May and September to make major physical changes. And no government in the world, including no provincial government in Canada, used the money they'd been given by the federal government in order to make real improvements in the life of older people. And they certainly didn't think about having thinking about them as citizens who have a life in society, a life in which they probably have more in common with the people out in the streets wanting change than they do with their own children who are in the middle of power. Well, that, that is damnedly true. And frankly, I think it's also another place where we have so much to learn from Indigenous people, where the central position of the elder in the community, in you know keeping the stories alive and in transmitting wisdom, is it, it's irreplaceable. We don't do that. And I, I certainly did not mean to enhance a negative view of 
those of our generation and beyond. But I think that we actually need a bit of convergence from whatever wisdom we've managed to gain over our, our three score and some somewhat with those coming up so that we can basically achieve greater strength, greater wisdom. I mean, it's been lovely uh, doing this with you. We've gone on and on, which is it's great. True. <laughs> it's true. I, I appreciate your, your willingness to take this subject in, in such depth. And uh, John, in parting, I just want to encourage people to, to pick up John's books, read them, preferably in paper, because they're better that way. They just are. Well, then you can uh, underline things and shout. You can, get, you can. But this and much more, I always look forward to your next, your next volume, John, and I hope that you'll have one for us in the not-too-distant future. Well, thank you very much, and keep up with your great work. Thank, thank you. you thank you, John. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. How are you? Hi, Brian. I'm just fine. Well, Happy New Year to you. For our listeners, uh, we recorded our conversation with John Ralston Saul just before the Christmas holidays, and now we are the week after the start of the new year. And uh, suddenly it seems that um, the relevance of our conversation is chillingly on everybody's tongue because uh, yesterday we experienced in the United States uh, what many people are characterizing as a direct assault on democracy and on democratic process um, around the uh, the transition of government in uh, in Washington. So that was a sobering moment, but I think it... Um, it raises for all of us the issue of, first of all, what a precious gift uh, living in a democratic society is, one in which freedoms and the, the rights and dignity of every individual are upheld by the force of law, and also how fragile democracy can be and how easily it can come under assault. And I'm, I'm struck by the fact that uh, one of the subjects that came up repeatedly in our conversation with John was the um, the toxic force of propaganda, which we've seen played out very dramatically and uh, and eerily in the events that we've just been living through. We don't know where all this is going to lead and where the the forces of um, of primitive uh, false populism, are going to take us, but they're with us. And I think that as citizens in uh, a democratic society, as people who um, believe in the dignity of every human being, every possible tool in our toolkit for safeguarding um, that which we used to take for granted, but can't anymore, is absolutely necessary. And uh, among the tools, in addition to laws and customs and our fundamental sense of decent behavior, is um, artistic expression. That's where we celebrate the qualities of the human being and the human spirit that give us all rights and dignity and our own place in the sun, and uh, the empathy and compassion and respect for others that uh, cause us to resist the trampling on those rights um, when the forces of darkness loom so chillingly in front of us. So uh, I uh, hats off to John for raising so many issues in such a, a provocative way and such a um, a great conversation. Olivia, um, you uh, were were glued to your set yesterday too, just as I was. Uh, you know, would you like to add anything to that? 
Well, Brian, I, I don't really think I could have said it any better myself. Um, I, I think it was a real privilege to have to have John on the show and to consider just how closely related art and democracy really are and how both of these things need protection. And we must uphold them now more than ever, really. Thank you. And it's it's so true. Um, the right to to vote is very closely related to the right to think, to express your thoughts and feelings. And uh, the purest expression of our thoughts and feelings is often in the pictures we draw, the poems that we write, the um, books that we choose to read, um, the films that we watch, and, of course, those that we create. So uh, here's to the arts. Um, may they always be a beacon for freedom and a force of light against the darkness of propaganda and those who would, um, and who really live in the never ending hope that they can take them away from us. Absolutely agreed, Brian. And now, Olivia, I understand that you have uh, a few additional bits of information that you would like to share with our friends. I do. I do indeed. Uh, if you like what you're hearing and if you care about art and democracy just as much as we do here at the Glenn Gould Foundation, we would love for you to keep up with us on social media by searching the Glenn Gould Foundation on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We're all over. You're likely to find us. If you want to keep listening to The Gold Standard, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also do us a little favor by rating us five stars and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, every little bit counts. And of course, we are a registered Canadian charitable organization. We rely on the support of generous donors from here and yon to help us keep our little ship afloat. Um, we aim to serve. So if you'd like to leave us a, a little tip, you can find out how to do so by clicking the appropriate button on our website, www.glengould.ca. We hope you'll visit it because there's a lot of additional um, news information and regularly uh, posted articles there for your entertainment and interest. And uh, now uh, I understand that uh, for those of you who might like to leave on a, on a happier note, um, who would like to hum, whistle, uh, do the jig or march off stage with us. Uh, our dear friend, Mr. Thomas Edison, is waiting in the wings. Take it away, Mr. Edison. <laughs> 